Welcome and good morning to the Farmer Wellness Webinar Series with Kathy Summers. Without further ado, Kathy Summers from the High Performance and Stress Management Clinic at the University of Guelph. Morning and a warm welcome to everybody. I'm Kathy Summers and I have a quick poll for you. I'm wondering how many of you would agree with me that turning on our stress response can deteriorate my health, deteriorate my performance, deteriorate my focus and my learning. How many of you actually would say that turning on the stress response can actually enhance my health, enhance my performance, and enhance my focus and learning? Who would actually agree to both of these? Because both of them are true. We're born with this amazing stress response. Sometimes you may have heard it called the fight, flight, freeze response, the emergency response, anxiety response. It is to mobilize and give us energy so I can act to fight or flee or freeze for survival. But it's also evolved so that it will enhance learning. It will promote connection. In fact, often we find very much with women, one of their stress responses may be going and talking to a friend. It's called tend and befriend. Sharing things with other people can help us cope well. So our stress response could be very, very good for us. Unfortunately, sometimes turned on too frequently, too often, it can make us ill. So today I want to talk to you about the stress response. The fact that if I'm feeling this surge of adrenaline and turning on all these stress chemicals, changes how I'm feeling. Sometimes it can feel good. Have you ever gone on the roller coaster? Maybe you're one of those folks who loves riding on the roller coaster. If we went on the roller coaster right now, we'd all have a response. Me, certainly my heart rate and my blood pressure will be going up because I'm a heart rate responder, but our muscles will be tight holding on change in our breathing or maybe even holding our breath. And maybe I'm sweating, change in blood flow patterns. It's not going to my fingers and my toes. The blood is being shunted to the big muscles so that I can fight the big muscles in my legs so I can run away. And it's just my body that's responding. My emotions are changing as well. On the roller coaster, some of us may feel really excited. Others might be saying, I'm feeling apprehensive or a bit nervous or maybe more than a bit nervous. I am feeling very, very stressed. I'm downright terrified. I'm panicked. It's not just our body and our emotions. When we're stressed, there's changes in how we think. It's a narrowing of our focus. So ideally, we're focusing on what needs to be done right now to get through this situation. So on the roller coaster, we're not saying, what am I going to have for lunch today? Am I going to have to stop at the store and pick something up so I've got some food to eat? You're not thinking about everything and processing all the stuff that you know. It's a very narrow focus. What do I need to do right now to stay safe on the roller coaster? Sometimes the focus can become too narrow. All I'm thinking about is my heart is pounding or I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die here on the roller coaster. If we get off that roller coaster, some of us would say that was wonderful. It was exhilarating, it was a high, let's just get right back on and go around again. This is called the good side of stress or the technical term you stress the greek suffix e u stress you stress means i'm enjoying these sensations the changes in my focus in my emotions in my body but if we get off that roller coaster and say that was awful i feel like i'm going to be sick i'm pulling the fingernails out of my palm all i can think about was how horrible that was. I never want to be in that situation again. This is the negative side of stress. It's called distress, the Greek suffix, D-I-S, distress. It was uncomfortable. My strength is in teaching people how to turn down the distress. Now, to turn down distress, we can't just say, this is really uncomfortable. I'm going to make it so that it's 
a good stress and it's healthy for me. It's you stress. We just can't say that like Pollyanna, this is good because we're gritting our teeth and saying, this is awful. I don't like it. So what we want to do is move to the middle ground. This is called the thrive position. Would you like to be the farmer who is the person who is living with the stress, aware of stress responses, but keeping them dialed back to a realistic level so that I'm not getting sick, that I'm performing well under pressure? Yes, it's very possible to do that, and you can teach yourself how. There's many possible ways to manage stress well. Today, I wanted to share with you the three pillars of being able to thrive under stress. The three pillars. One, the ability to self-calm when I'm noticing these changes in my emotions, my body, and where my mind is going. Two, the ability to change what I'm saying inside my head, self-talk. Research shows that good stress copers, because in the research they break it down into people who are coping well with stress and people who are coping poorly with stress. The good stress copers have the ability to self-calm and talk a particular way to themselves, and they have good self-care. So these are the three dimensions that I want to go through today. Our first pillar is about self-calming. When I teach stress management classes, I often begin the training by self-calming with the muscles in our body. Muscles are responding in a stress response. Are you aware that there are two muscle areas that are programmed in to the stress reaction? So they are responding instantly, unconsciously, and automatically every time I'm perceiving this is a challenge, that I'd be feeling overwhelmed, that my resources are not up to demands of the situation, or I just don't like this situation. I said there are two muscles that are programmed into this response, automatically responding. Have you figured out what they are? One of these muscle areas is our jaw. We're built like other animals. If you back an animal into a corner, they will bite you to try and get away in that situation. We're programmed that we will also tighten up here to try and bite our way through the stressful situation. If we're holding tension in our jaw and we're not chewing gum or food, our brain is getting a message that we're holding tension in our jaw. And our brain will perceive that as I'm trying to fight my way through this tough situation. Obviously, this is a challenge. Fight harder and we'll turn on even more of our stress response. So I'm going to suggest that we start monitoring our jaw let go of any tension that we find there if it's not necessary for the situation, like chewing our meal. In that way, hacking into that feedback loop that's saying, I'm stressed and I need to ramp up my stress responses further. So teeth apart and releasing any pressure from the tongue will start relaxing the jaw area. Muscle region number two is around our waist. Like the vet students who come to my programs, They'll say, this makes sense. The professor is telling me, I can tell the horse is stressed as I'm approaching my horse. If I'm watching below their rib cage, they're tucking up at their waist. They're preparing for a fight. We're preparing for that too. We get tight around our waist, pulling in all those muscles, really preparing for a punch, a blow, a kick, because our ribs only come down so far, no bony protection, lower down in our abdomen. So we create a muscular shield to protect ourselves. Relaxing around that area will also break into some of the feedback loops, decrease some of the stress and anxiety, and turn on our clear thinking brain. Because once these two regions are tightening up, we're thinking only about defense and we're not able to perform well if you've ever had mental blocks in demanding situations, in a test, and then afterwards said, oh, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I ask that question? Commonly, it's because of tension in these two areas or a shift in how we're breathing. So let's do a quick check in and practice releasing tightness from these areas. Right now, take your hands and put your hands at the level of your belly button. 
Let your shoulders be at ease, relaxing your arms. Cut out all distractions. Avoid looking at the screen. Avoid looking at printed materials. Maybe even closing your eyes or half closing your eyes right now to look downwards at a spot on the floor. With your eyes closed or half closed, tuning in, checkpoint one, jaw. Ask yourself, is there any tension in my jaw right now? Are my teeth touching? What's the position of my tongue? As you're tuning into your jaw, simulate that fight reaction. Right now, gently press your teeth together, lightly and comfortably feeling where the pressure is. And also push your tongue against the roof of your mouth or your teeth, whatever feels most natural. Not everybody presses their tongue as part of this reaction, but some people do. Notice what you're feeling in the jaw. As you're tuning into the jaw and where the tensions can be, register the sensations and now switch it all off like switching off a light. Bring your teeth apart, release the pressure from the tongue, hack into the escalating of a stress response by releasing the tensions in your jaw. Your new mantra from today onwards, teeth apart, release the tension from the tongue. And as you're relaxing the jaw, still aware of your body, eyes closed or half closed, notice how it feels when the jaw is more at ease. Register that. And going now to checkpoint two, waist. Is there any tension here at your waist? Frankly, most people usually have no idea what's going at their waist. They're often too busy just trying to get through the rest of their day. So while you can pay attention right now, notice the region around your waist from your belly button to your backbone. And while you're noticing that region, pulling your stomach just a little bit, like someone's taking your photo, you want to look a bit more slim and trim, so you're pulling your stomach just a little bit. And they haven't figured out how to work the camera. So you keep holding and holding and holding. And while you're holding that light tension around your waist, register where you feel that, not just behind your hands. There's tension also below the ribs at your sides and your low back. It's like a belt going from your belly button to your backbone. Notice those sensations. And as you're tuning into it, notice also the tension in your chest and your shoulders because your brain is getting a message saying, there's tension around my waist. It makes it hard to breathe naturally using our primary breathing muscle, the diaphragm muscle at the level of the lower ribs. So the brain says, get the part-time workers on the job. We need to really make sure we're breathing well. And the part-time workers are the muscles in our chest our shoulders, even the neck muscle. Can you feel this extra effort, the extra work of breathing from the chest and shoulders? There's many names for overusing these muscles while we're breathing. One of the names for this breathing pattern is an anxiogenic breathing pattern. A fancy term that simply means it generates anxiety. So if I had no stressors on my mind at all, it was a lovely holiday, I'm away from the farm, I could still be turning on anxiety by tightening my jaw, by tightening my waist, or breathing in an anxiogenic pattern. We're starting to turn on this anxiety, this discomfort around our waist, with that tightness around the waist. So right now, let it go. Finally, they've taken the photograph. You can release the tension from the waist. We rarely let go of all tension the first time we say to let it go. So tell yourself, let it go more. Let it go even more at the waist. So you're breathing more effortlessly, low in your trunk from your waist, from that primary breathing muscle, the diaphragm. In fact, the more you can let go of tension at your waist, you might start to notice each time you breathe in, 
The hands on your belly button move a little bit forward towards the computer in front of you. Effortlessly, each time you breathe in. To review, each time you breathe in. When the waist is relaxed, your hands, your belly button will move a little bit forward towards the computer in front of you. Unless obviously you're chewing, you're obviously you're um, wearing such tight jeans or a tight belt, tight clothing, you're so restrictive, there might be no movement there. Or some of my clients, they've been under stress for so many weeks, so many months, they're so good at holding that defensive shield engaged at their waist. The first time we do this, they cannot relax and let go of the tensions at the waist. So not to worry if there's no movement at your waist with breathing right now. If you were to practice every day for two weeks or three weeks, you'd get it. It's a skill that simply develops with practice. For the first week, I'd recommend lying down. A little bit easier to relax around your hips and your waist. Then starting to notice the movement at your waist when you let go of the tensions there. Aware of the breathing naturally from the waist area. And then with more practice, we know that we can more fully relax if I let the tension go in my jaw, let the tension go at my waist and breathe low in my trunk from the waist region at the same time, I'm slowing down my breathing. If I'm breathing more low from the trunk and slow with a longer blow out, I can start calming myself and turning on the smart part of my brain, the performance brain. One of the things that I've been hoping with having the slides today was to show you a little bit of information about what happens when we do this. You can open your eyes right now. I don't have the slide to show you, but it was a review that if I was to relax my jaw, I relax my waist and breathe not only low in my trunk from the waist and slow, but with a longer blowout. If I could change the pace of breathing so that it's a slower pace, Instead of breathing our average pace of about 12 breaths in one minute, the slide I was going to show you was of a student I was working with at the university who experienced anxiety. The blue line on the trace showed that he was breathing 22 breaths a minute, which I suspected was a great contributor to the anxiety he was experiencing. After one week of practicing at home, he came back and the second trace was gonna show you, slow down the breathing. So he was breathing only six breaths in a minute when he was taking time to practice every day. It's a slow pace, slower than we usually breathe when we're in a meeting, when we're working on the farm, when we're dealing with our children, when we're having a meal. The average breathing pace is about 12 or 13 breaths a minute. But his program was to practice, take some time every day, 15 to 20 minutes every day, practicing, breathing only six breaths in a minute or slowing down towards that whatever was comfortable for him. He was comfortable at breathing six breaths in a minute and noticing a great decrease in his anxiety in the first week. People who can get that pattern of breathing in and out, in and out, slowly, somewhere close to six breaths in a minute, changes the pattern of our heartbeats so that when we're breathing in, our heart rate is speeding up. And when we exhale, our heart rate is slowing down. Science is telling us that if we can get this sine wave pattern of heartbeats, that our heart rate is speeding up while we breathe in and slowing down when we breathe out, which is demonstrated only when we're breathing slowly and our mind is calm, focused. It seems to be the hallmark that I'm kicking in the parasympathetic nervous system of my body. So I'm healing, restoring, recharging, energizing. In fact, it's been shown that in addition to being so good for our heart health, 
decreasing inflammatory responses, decreasing anxiety, decreasing symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome. It also enhances our performance. People can think more clearly. People in sport perform better, they get more baskets, they hit the baseball more frequently. CEOs who do this at work for three minutes out of every hour, breathing slowly and getting their heart going into this particular pattern of beats, say they get more work done, it's more quality work, and they have more energy at the end of the day. Who would love to be able to say that? You are the CEO of your farm. You can get the same benefits these executives are getting with your performance. In fact, the most recent research is showing people who can get this particular pattern of heartbeats are more resilient. And resiliency is where we want to be. One of the handouts that you've downloaded was a checklist of common stress symptoms. If you've gone through and looked at it, you may find that you tend to tick off a lot in the physical column. I get a lot of headaches. My neck and back are really tight. My stomach and my GI tract are getting upset or I do have flare-ups of inflammatory or irritable bowel syndrome. Maybe I'm the person who is having trouble focusing and thinking and it's cognitive. My performance mentally is deteriorating. Maybe it's emotional. I've got a shorter fuse. My emotions are all over the map. I'm crying all the time and I'm not really sure why this is happening. Maybe there's other changes. I'm withdrawing. I'm isolating myself. Maybe I'm smoking more, drinking more. Maybe it's hard to fall asleep. If you're checking off some of these things, it's common that we do respond to stress. Too much of the stress response creates distress that can impact our health. Several years ago, Andrea Jones Bitten at the University of Guelph did a survey of 1,100 Canadian farmers. She was finding that with these Canadian farmers, 45% of them were saying they were experiencing high levels of stress, distress. In fact, 58% of them were experiencing high anxiety. 58% experiencing high anxiety. If you are comfortable slowing down your breathing, then I would strongly recommend doing 20 minutes daily for 10 weeks to see what might happen with those anxiety levels. Some people tell me they're not comfortable doing breathing exercises. It reminds me of them a time when their asthma was acting up and they couldn't catch their breath. They've got a negative association to doing things with breathing just from past experience. So the good news is there's other techniques besides breathing that can be very effective for decreasing anxiety. Jones Bitten's study also found that 38% of people found that they were exhausted. If you are a farmer experiencing emotional exhaustion and high levels of cynicism, these are key indicators a burnout. If you look at the research on burnout, some of the most recent studies are strongly suggesting the difference between those who get burnout and those who do not are a strong support network. In the farming community, because of these stats, the high levels of distress in farmers. There's a very strong movement now to try and recognize and be more aware of what our stress responses are and to increase our level of resources. And one big one there is our support network. In addition to getting started with some general personal stress management principles today, I am gonna be encouraging you if you do have the high level of anxiety, if you do have high levels of exhaustion and cynicism, or if you're in that 35% of those farmers who are experiencing depression, 
to go beyond what we're talking about today and seek out professional help. Begin by talking to your colleagues, other farmers, people in your community, but seeking out professional assistance as well. It's that support network and personal strategies combined that are going to get you the strongest impact. A few years ago, Margaret Mack did her PhD research on stress in farmers in the New England area. The title of her article summarizing her dissertation was Stress and Farmers, an Unsustainable Relationship. She titled it this, because stress in farming is rising. It's unsustainable if it's having a negative impact on our health and performance. I'm so glad that you're here today so that you can get some tips and just take some time for yourself to think about this topic and ask yourself, what's the next step forward for me? I said there were three pillars to begin doing something for yourself in addition to seeking out support network and resources. The first pillar was the ability to self-calm. If I can relax my muscles, jaw and waist, slow down my breathing, make it more low in my trunk and have a longer exhale than it takes time to inhale. If I'm doing these things and relaxing and calming my body, another way I can tell that I'm getting more relaxed is the warm blood will start flowing back to my fingers and toes because part of the stress response is saying, I'm stressed right now, I need to deal with it. And body says, shut the blood away from the fingers and toes and the stomach and get it to the big muscles in the arm to fight and the big muscles in my legs so that I can run or kick. A sign I'm relaxing is the warm blood goes back to my hands and my feet. So if I can check my breathing, my muscles, the warmth in my extremities, BMW, breathing, muscles, and warmth, these are things that can tell me if I am getting better in my skills at self-calming right here and right now. In addition to self-calming, what am I saying to myself inside my head? Before we go with the second pillar, quick review with eyes open or closed or half closed looking at the floor. Checkpoint one, Relax your jaw right now, teeth apart, release any pressure from the tongue that crept in over the last few minutes. As your jaw is relaxing, check point two, waist. Let go of any tensions at your waist. Let go more at your waist and more. And as you're letting go more and more at your waist, allow the breathing as much as you can right now. If you're okay thinking about breathing, let it be more low at your waist, so there's small movement each time you breathe in. And slow it down with a longer exhalation. If you were to do for this for three minutes or more, we know there's physiological changes in good heart function, inflammatory response, and starting to change the way our brain thinks. We're turning on our thinking brain. We can now perform. Having done a few minutes now of self-calming, what do you tend to say inside your head? Dr. Friedman, looking at the people who are resilient in the face of stressful situations, found there were four characteristics of the stress-resistant people in how they were thinking. First, they were action oriented. They would be asking themselves, what can I do? At this point, you may be saying to yourself, well, what can I do? <laughs> the crop got in late. I can't be out there harvesting it right now. What can I do? You do what you can. What can you do? You focus on what you can. It's a late crop. Wait, I'm gonna monitor my crop. I'm gonna fix my auger. 
I'm going to prepare my equipment. I'm going to do more searching on the internet if I need more information. I'm going to access things from the grain farmers of Ontario, the specialists that they've got there. I'm going to talk to others. I'm going to work on my support network. I'm going to stay strong, getting good sleep, eating nutritiously, doing things for fun. I might not be able to control the situation, but I can control my reactions in the situation. I can regulate my stress responses as I'm thinking about the situation using BMW. So the smart farmer would be saying, what can I do even in this situation? Item number two, the good stress copers who are resilient are realistic. What realistically can I do and what is unrealistic? What will not fit into the time frame that I've got? Most, far most farmers that I know shine in this area, being realistic. The third point from Friedman was to avoid catastrophizing. For most of my clients, this is their nemesis. Inside their head, there's a little voice. What if the harvest is too wet? It's too late. It's unsaleable. What if I've lost my crop? What if there's a huge financial hit? What if it's worse than I was even expecting? What if the debt is more than I can handle? What if I can't afford to put my kids in hockey or music? What if the neighbors don't understand? What if the government policies don't hold up? What if, what if, what if? Scarier and scarier. This is why it's called catastrophizing. I am moving along the train track, getting to a scarier and scarier position. A catastrophe. Does this sound like you? Inside your head, do you jump on the what if train and just keep rolling? This is the fastest way that I know to get anxious and stressed. It pushes all of the buttons. We're scaring ourselves with possible negative scenarios. We're built to be worriers. We're built with a worrying brain. Six weeks from now, we're gonna have the webinar specifically talk about worrying. We're really gonna get into the what ifing if you're an expert at that and need a little bit more than what we're just able to delve in today to get on top of it. But it's normal to be able to look into next week and next month and predict possible problems. What our brain wants us to do when it sees a potential problem is to come up with a plan. Remember the item that I mentioned a few minutes ago? To come up with a plan. What am I going to do to survive and get through that situation if it occurs? That will start calming us. We might not like the situation. It might not be pretty, but I will handle it if it occurs. I've got a plan. It might be embarrassing to go back to the bank to renegotiate. It might be uncomfortable to talk to my neighbors about what's going on and how I'm feeling. But research tells us we can get through it. Focusing on the actions I can take is extremely helpful. The challenge is that the human brain tends to railroad us, not only into saying what if, but it gets us stuck there. We tend to overestimate how bad things can be and underestimate our abilities to deal with it. So if you're a person who does tend to catastrophize, the what if voice speaks up really strongly, I'm gonna highly recommend from today forward, you have a mantra and the mantra is, I will handle it. I might not like it, and it might not be easy, but I will handle this. So to sum up, if I tend to say, what if, what if, stop it right there. Stop. Relax the jaw. 
relax the waist, slow down your breathing, and say to yourself, I will handle it. I'm an intelligent, creative person with strengths and talents and resources. And I can develop new skills as a farmer to cope better, to become even more resilient. I will handle it with my resources and my own skills. I will get better at handling it. Finally, Friedman said, resilient farmers, resilient people would be the ones who are hopeful. Hopeful doesn't mean unrealistically thinking it's going to be great. Hopeful means I know that this is a negative event maybe happen and I expect it will upset me. In fact, it could really upset me. But I am hopeful that it will be something I am getting through. Life happens. It's not always easy or pretty, but I expect to get over it, to get through it. So how do you rank on these ways of thinking? It is normal for the human brain to catastrophize, to be aware of problem, to sometimes get sucked into thinking only about the problem and how bad it could be. But the resilient person is action-oriented. What can I do? Realistic. What can and can't be done in the time that I've got with the skills that I've got. They recognize when they're catastrophizing and saying, what if? And start shifting it to, so what? I will handle it. And looking forward to getting through it. How do you rank? on these ways of thinking. They themselves are... I think that we're back now. And we seem to be back. We lost power on our computer. We're practicing stress management here. <laughs> and just to get back into it, I'm gonna get you, as long as the folks here on our end, to take just a quick minute to review what we've already done. In the face of this stressful situation, we're handling it. One, jaw teeth apart. Release the pressure from your tongue, relaxing the jaw joint area. Two, waist. Let go of the tension at the waist. Let it go more and more at the waist. And as you're breathing more low in your trunk from the waist, slow it down. Slow it down, breathing a bit more low and slow with a longer blow out. Reminding yourself, I will handle it. As uncomfortable, as tough as the situation may be, what can I do now to cope through this situation? So I think that we're back now and we've had a chance to practice self-calming, self-talk, the final pillar that we could begin working on to begin decreasing our stress is the realm of self-care. I grew up on a family farm where we would meet for every meal. Imagine my surprise as an adult to realize that my best friend and her husband on their farm would work through all meals when they were harvesting, eating maybe once a day. We know that if we skip meals, it increases our stress response. Our body expects fuel to come in in the form of food. If food is not coming in, our body says, I need some energy to keep on going. The food is in. And so I'm going to release some chemicals to mobilize my fat stores, burn a little bit of muscle if I need to. So I'm going to have some energy to keep on going. You might be saying that sounds pretty good. I want to mobilize those fat stores, but it's the harshest of all of our stress chemicals. Unfortunately, rising then our stress level. And for people, not only will it decrease our performance, and that's why they've got breakfast programs in schools, for people who are prone to headache, GI problems, anxiety and panic, 
skipping meals, going long, too long without food will really escalate these symptoms. So food rule number one is to eat every three to four hours to prevent stress chemicals from flooding into my body. And if I'm gonna be eating every three to four hours, as a farmer, I'd like to eat for energy. I want to eat when I'm having a meal or a snack every three to four hours in that meal or snack to have a combination, eating some carbohydrates for energy fast right now, that's why I'm eating, and some protein, so I'm getting energy to last three to four more hours. So every time I eat, I want a combination, some carbs with some protein, so I'll have energy fast and to last over the next three to four hours and prevent stress chemicals, escalating anxiety and deteriorating my ability to think clearly. This may mean planning ahead, especially in the harvest season, packing things that I can take with me in my harvester, things that don't need to be refrigerated, where I will have the protein and carbs with me as an emergency, I could put in the glove compartment of the truck, have some in my knapsack, my bag, that I carry with me. In addition to watching skipping meals, we also want to be aware of how much caffeine and sugar we're eating. Caffeine and sugar are considered false friends. They promise they're gonna give us all this energy. However, two to three hours later, they turn around and stab us in the back by depleting our energy even more. Research shows that I'm gonna have less energy two hours from now than I would have had if I hadn't had the caffeine or sugar at all. So I'm taking it maybe to get some energy, but in the end, it's gonna rob me of energy. So the food rule here is not to avoid caffeine and sugar completely because we tend to love those things. But I avoid having it on an empty stomach. I never eat caffeine or sugar alone. And that doesn't mean I'm in a closet all by myself eating it so nobody can see. It means eating it by itself. I'm gonna have my carbs and my protein first and then have the caffeine and the sugar after. So my blood sugars are a little bit more stable when I'm consuming them. So I'm having it because I enjoy it. I'm not consuming the caffeine or the sugar for energy because they're poor energy contributors. The carbs and the protein are my strong energy sources. Having them every three to four hours is what's gonna get me through the harvest and get me through planting. Besides thinking about how I'm eating, it's going to be very helpful to keep physically active. If I'm moving my body, exercising, I am burning the stress chemicals out of my body. People who are anxious, those 58% of farmers who tend to have high levels of anxiety, if I'm moving my body, I will experience less anxiousness. It will turn down um, my risk of having panic attacks. You might feel right now like you're running around farm to farm, that there's a lot of physical activity. But I'm willing to bet in the wintertime or in the summer, when you're not out there in the field all the time, there's not the same impetus to be so physically active. Moving your body for 20 continuous minutes so my heart rate is elevated above 100 beats a minute for that continuous 20 minutes, at least five days a week will burn some of those stress chemicals out of the body. You cannot overestimate the benefits of physical activity. The other realm within self-care is to protect your sleep. Do you experience Toronto syndrome on the farm? Most farms are quite a distance from Toronto, but Toronto syndrome is staying up late so I can get more work done, getting up really early so I can get more work done. This often will happen when we're in the harvest season, whether I'm in Toronto or not. Cutting short on sleep puts me more at risk for metabolic disorders. One night short on sleep puts me into a pre-diabetic state. One night short on sleep 
means that if I'm being presented with new material, I'm going to only be processing about 60% of that new material. So my ability to learn greatly decreases. One night short on sleep means that I will be greater risk of being moody and arguing with people. And if my partner is also short on sleep that night, there's a greater risk that the two of us, if we're arguing, it will be very nasty. Just one night short on sleep can have huge impact on our thinking, our mood, our health. Protect your sleep time so you've got the energy that you need to get through harvest, to get through planting. Most of my clients who come to my Better Sleep program are actually in bed for the number of hours that we would recommend. Their greatest difficulty is shutting off their busy brain. They're too busy thinking about all the things they have to do. Or they're catastrophizing with all the litany of what if, what if, what if. They think about it more when they're in bed than at any other time during the day. Two weeks from now, our webinar topic is going to be about sleep. Predominantly talking about how do I settle down my mind as well as my body. So I'm setting the stage for sleep to overtake me while I'm in bed. We'll also be talking about how can I fall back to sleep? more easily if I wake up in the night? And how can I ensure that I'm getting more into the deepest level of sleep, the slow wave stage of sleep, that the superpower recharge to heal me, restore me, and give me the energy I want for the next day? So we're going to be talking more about these things in a couple of weeks' time. For now, if you could just avoid the Toronto syndrome, trying to protect your sleep. And when you're in bed, Instead of thinking about tomorrow or things that are going on today or the equipment that's breaking down or the financial challenges that you're facing right now, these types of thoughts are daytime thoughts. They're revving up your mind. Your goal in bed is to let your brain and your body rest. You know that saying, to everything there is a season. There's a time to plant and there's a time to harvest. In bed, it's time to rest. During the day, it is time to work and to think. So from tonight onwards, when you're in bed, your training is going to be to remind yourself that the other thoughts that tend to be coming in now, those are daytime thoughts. Put them away in the closet. Mentally put them away with my computer. Mentally put them away in the far field. Put those th daytime thoughts away. So right now in bed, I can rest. And you know, we've already talked about resting today. When I'm in bed, I can start resting by relaxing my jaw and then my waist and slowing down my breathing and making the exhale longer. So I'm breathing low and slow with a longer blowout, letting the warm blood go back to my hands and my feet, if I've got blankets over top of me, I might even begin to feel that. Do you ever not want to get out of bed some mornings because it's so warm and cozy underneath the blankets? You can actually encourage the relaxation when you're in bed. If you just remember a time when you were warm and cozy underneath the blankets or in the sunshine or a hot tub or the hot shower, thinking these things in bed can help you rest and set the stage for sleep to overtake you. We'll delve more into that two weeks time, how I can further rest my brain and body. So far today, I've been talking about the pillars of decreasing stress and increasing resiliency that you can begin on your own. The ability to self calm, the self talk you're saying inside your head, and self-care with exercise, sleep, the way that I'm eating. The other handout that I've given you is about supports that you can access in your community. I'm going to encourage you to think about those supports. I'm also going to encourage you to look at the handout 
that you download it that asks you about what is your action plan. I'm going to get you to take a minute right now and ask yourself, what is doable for you? What makes sense for you from what we've talked about? How would you self-calm through the rest of the day today for 30 seconds here, 30 seconds there, or when you get in bed at night? How would you self-calm? What would you say to yourself to move toward that resilient self-talk? Or what self-care item could you do just a little bit more of today? So take that handout right now and start drafting your action plan of how you would self-calm, self-talk, self-care within the next 48 hours to begin training soon. Because chances are if you don't do it within 48 hours, you're not going to do it at all. So what, when, where are you going to do something over the next 48 hours? Take a minute now and just write that down for yourself. As you're finishing that up, think in your mind. Really internalize that. What, when, where you're going to be using that today, tonight, tomorrow, through the week, on the weekend. Really internalizing that. If you're still jotting down, continue finishing up your plan. If you've got some questions, write them in the chat box if you haven't already done so. So if you've got any questions in our remaining minutes, that we can get to those. The most important thing is to have a plan, a doable plan of action. Start with yourself and what you can do. The resilient farmer is like the oak that is flexible and bends in the wind, not the one that's rigid and breaks. As hard as it may be to develop some skills, to be more flexible in looking after yourself and reaching out to see your port, to your supports, I'm strongly recommending that you do that. Now, I'm wondering what questions you've got. If there's anything further that would be helpful from this topic for stress management for today. Kathy, I have a question. Um, how do you combat the bad stress coping mechanisms? Or how do you kind of get yourself out of using those mechanisms as a coping mechanism? Are you talking about drinking more alcohol and smoking more cigarettes and tapping your foot and being more impatient and those yes. kinds of things? Yeah. Or staying up later and watching mindless TV binging? Um, the first thing to do is to recognize what's going on. Your awareness is the first step. And rather than beating yourself up, trying to understand or acknowledge that this, this is a stress response. Some people are doing these behaviors because they're trying to avoid the feelings of that stress, of that discomfort, of that emotion. They, the feeling of uncertainty, the feeling of being stressed and anxious because I don't know what's going to happen in the uncertain future. And so I would suggest, first of all, acknowledging or understanding these are stress responses, and then asking myself, am I doing these because I'm trying to avoid certain feelings or emotions? And if the answer is yes, can I sit with those feelings or emotions for just a minute, just to be aware that, yeah, this is an uncomfortable situation. We'd like to be happy and feel great all the time, but that's not life. So yeah, this is how I'm feeling right now. And then ask yourself, what could I do that would be helpful right now? And sometimes it might be helpful to do one of the self-calming things that we've talked about. It might be helpful to use some of the self-talk we've talked about. Sometimes it might be helpful to replace the behavior that I was doing with something that makes me feel good. And one of those things often is connection, connecting with other people. So that's how I would start. And to be a bit more successful, maybe writing it down. This is what I'm aware of. 
this is what I'm going to try the next time. And then checking it off that this was what I tried or this was why it was hard to do it. But it's just step by step, doing it in small little chunks that you would be more successful. Awareness is the first step. Come up with a small plan that's doable. Try it out. See what happens. And with all of these ideas that I'm sharing with you today, the next step, if you're trying it and you're finding it's hard, you talk to other people maybe, and they also maybe are finding it harder, they aren't giving you more ideas, then seek out professional help to get more ideas about how to implement it. A question that's come in would be about an example of implementing the action plan. If the action plan that I just drafted there was to relax my jaw and relax my waist um, and to uh, not have so much caffeine today, the way that I would implement something like that would be um, every time I uh, check my phone for a text or a phone message, as I'm putting my phone away, I would use that as a reminder to just relax my jaw, relax my waist, slowly take a breath in and even slower take a breath out and say, I will handle it. What can I do now to cope effectively through the next hour? Good for me, I've just done a, a quick training there. And I'm reminding myself that instead of having the caffeine, I've got my, uh, my uh, trail mix with the nuts and the dried fruit. So I'm gonna be having that for my snack and I'm gonna be drinking water or another maybe better liquid than the caffeine. And I'm gonna try that as an experiment today in my morning. That's how I'm gonna begin implementing my action plan after a few days, see how it's going, and then see if I wanna change my action plan or build on it if it's going really well. Another question that's come in, what would you recommend for farmers coping with anxiety provoking coworkers, family members, stress and relationships? This is really challenging because sometimes the demands that are coming in on us are coming in from other people. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. You should be handling it in a particular way. This is like a tyrant. We can talk inside our head saying the shoulds, the got tos, I have to. But sometimes it's not just inside us. It's coming from other people. Often when it's coming from other people, it's the most stressful. My recommendation, get better at self-calming yourself, number one. Number two, when you're not head-to-head, -head, maybe after you've had a comfortable meal, so you're both feeling comfortable because you're not grumbly in your tummy, you're not short of temper because you don't have any food in your stomach, then is the time to take a minute not telling anybody that you're just relaxing your jaw, relaxing your waist, taking an easy breath in, easy breath out, and saying, we're coming up to a stressful time, or today's been a really stressful day. There's a lot of pressures on me. This is what I'm saying to myself inside my head about trying to get everything done today. But I realize that you also want me to do all of these things today. It's very tough to do it all and to have five bosses, my children, my partner, the co-op that I am uh, taking the grain to, and everything that I'm saying to myself that I should be doing as a professional farmer. It's really hard to have all of these bosses. So let's work together on what we can think is doable. This is where you could help me. It might be by cutting me some slack. It might be giving me some cues if I'm behaving a particular way, a reminder without being an egg. And I'll make a deal that I'll tell you when I need your help, that it would be helpful if you did something for me, if you made lunch for me today, or if you took the kids to school today, so I don't have to do that. So we're negotiating. This is the hardest thing, to be able to self-calm and to negotiate with other people so that both of you know where you're at. In the workplace, Many people don't realize the many hats that you're wearing and all the things that you're trying to get done today. If you can calmly say, these are all the things that are on my plate today, you're trying to add in one or th two or three more, can you help me figure out what will get done today? Because it doesn't sound like there's gonna be time for it all. Time is one of our greatest stressors, as we know in farming.
I think we're coming towards the end of the time that we've got for the questions. If you do have more questions for me or you want more personalized um, information for the scenarios that you're thinking, don't hesitate to contact me. I am at the Stress Management High Performance Clinic at the University of Guelph. You can Google that. You'll find my webpage and contact information for me there. You also know that I'll be back in two weeks. We'll be talking about sleep. In four weeks, we'll talking be very specifically about anxiety and how we can feel all revved up inside, some uncomfortable physical sensations and catastrophizing inside my head. What can we do to settle this down? And six weeks time, we're going to be talking about worry very specifically. What if gets me into trouble? I do overestimate how bad that can be and underestimate my ability to deal with a tough situation. The uncertainty about the future is just about getting me, pulling my hair out, driving me crazy. So that's what we're going to be going in the future. Between now and then, take care. And that means self-calm, self-talk, and self-care. Have a great week.